Welcome to Abstract Illusions Radio with host Jennifer Hillman. The show explores and reveals the human potential through creativity. So enjoy the show to create a life you love. Hello and welcome to Abstract Illusions Radio. This is your host, Jennifer Hellman, who is honored and is pleased to have Gary Gallagher on here tonight. Gary has lived through most of rock history firsthand, including working with most, most of the biggest talents in music. Gary now is the CEO of W Rock as well as hosting his own show. He is also in charge of two online magazines, Rock On and On Air. He also owns El Chicano, one of the biggest bands in the 70s and an influence in today's music. His accomplishments and other talents continues on. So I welcome Gary Gallagher to air. And I thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be to join us today. Thank you, Jennifer. It's a pleasure being here on your show and uh, loving it. Um, looking forward to talking to all your listeners and uh, sharing a little bit about my music history, my music past. And uh, it's actually been a lot more than 35 years. It's been actually 42 years that I've been involved with the music scene since 19, uh, 1974, I believe it is. And now it's 2006. So... Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a it's been a wonderful ride. And when I look back uh, on uh, the past 42 years of my life, I'm the most amazed guy on earth because uh, the music scene uh, that I got involved with back in the 70s was the burgeoning scene of, of music uh, as we know it today. But it was the icons of rock and roll that were just starting out, like the Eagles and J.D. Salter and Warren Zevon and so many more. And like you said about El Chicano as well. El Chicano started in 1970, um, and uh, you know, still going strong today. So I'm, I'm amazed myself when I look back on my own past. So uh, you know, let's all be amazed together. Yes, Ed. Yes, Ed. And we need to mention since this just happened, David Bowie's passing and his influence on music. Do you think that music really today? could be as it is now without people like David Bowie or Mick Jagger or even Led Zepp, El Chicano. They all had such a strong impression on music today. And I think especially David Bowie. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because David was a good friend and um, I'm saddened. I woke up, uh, my my wife Victoria uh, told me yesterday uh, that that he had passed and uh, um, I was, I was, it was like I had a real empty feeling throughout the whole day. I tried to remember all the good things in life with, with David, which were many, many, many ones. But, you know, I knew that David, I was one of the few that knew that David was, was very sick and it was kept quiet for a year and a half. And, you know, I, I used to wake up and, and think of David quite a bit over the last year and a half. And ironically, the day before David died, I put up a photograph of, of David, um, at Peter Sellers' house, a party that we all attended at Peter Sellers' house for the Rolling Stones back in 1975. Um, and um, it was a good memory, and I put it up there, and, and it was ironic that, you know, within hours of putting that photograph up that David would pass. But in, in regards to your question, guys like David um, and and so many that, that came along at the same time, uh, the, the 70s were, that was the birth of rock and roll as I know it. I mean, Sure, you go back to the 50s and 60s, and that was but the real rock and roll, in my opinion, started around around 1969, 1970. And guys like like David, when when David came along, and David was unique. He was there was just nobody. There'll never be another David. Um, and he 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 re, uh, he re- resurrected himself so many different times and and re reignited rock and roll in so many different ways. Um, guys like him and, and, and Elton John and uh, Rod Stewart and uh, the, the mm-hmm. Led Zeppelin and uh, you know I'm, I'm mentioning a lot of the British guys out there because I'm from Britain myself and I, when I came over here I knew a lot of these guys. Uh, Nazareth was another band of the, that mm-hmm. uh, ACDC. Um, you know I can na- I can name off hundreds of bands in the 70s that are significant music uh, icons of this day. In regards to music today, I don't think we'll ever see uh, the 70s again. The, the, the influence of music by so many different bands and, and, and performers like David Bowie. 
um, you won't see that again because there's no room for it anymore. Um, everything's targeted now. Everything's streamlined now. Everything's you know pinpointed now down now by by PR and uh, and you know the. 70s was the era of rock and roll competition. When mm -hmm. I always say that, um, you know, I worked with all of, all the bands that were coming through in that time because I was with Atlantic Records and Emma Erdogan, and I used to I used to know these guys before they became uh, the icons they, they they were, and you know, still you know afterwards. But you know, the hardest thing in the world was to get on the Billboard charts. Mm -hmm. the, the the thing even harder than that was to stay on the Billboard charts, right? Because right. there was Always competition. There was always somebody nipping at your heels. If Rod Stewart made it on, Elton John was right behind him, not about to knock him off. You know, and uh, you have a lot of one-hit wonders in in the in the 70s because they made it to the top, but it was very hard to stay there. It was very hard to get on the charts, and you know, you had a lot of um, uh, groups and a lot of songs that made it onto the charts, um, and were there for five, six, seven weeks and made it to number one, but maintaining that roost it was very very hard uh, mainly because you had so many fantastic bands so many fantastic performers and it was uh, an era where you had places like on the sunset strip out here in los angeles where i grew up um you had uh you know whiskey a go-go you had filthy McNatt's, right. you had um you know the london fog you had roxy's you know you know, had uh, you had so many different places where you could go on a Saturday or a Friday or you know or anytime during the week and see the what is now the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame performing. And I'm not talking about in a week. I'm talking about in the same night. I remember seeing J.D. Souther playing, and across the street Jackson Brown would be playing. And down the street the Doors would be playing. And across the street Love would be playing, and down the street Linda Ronstadt would be playing, all in the same night. Not in the same week or in the same month or in the same year, but in the same night. And this was ongoing, you know. Go up and look, you know, if you're if you're new in music, Google whiskey, Google, uh, you know, the Roxy, Google, uh, you know, Elton John came over here and was playing the Roxy for free. You know, that's yeah. how he started his career. You know, so you had places where you could actually go and perform as a performer, and as as somebody in the music business, I could go see 30, 40, 50 bands in a week, and I'll do it within. You know, two or three hundred yard, you know, circumference of of, uh, of a place in Hollywood. So, um, you know, that's gone now. That doesn't exist anymore. So it's very very hard for for um, bands coming up, uh, entertainers coming up to get recognized and and compete for that that slot, which is in the, you know still on the Billboard charts. But it's, it's it's so hard to to determine what what is you know, what is good and what is bad in rock and roll and, or in music anymore because it's all, you know, it's all prefabricated now, if you ask me. I, I don't want to put down music today, but there's very little competition in music today. There's very little real music today. It's all, it's all programmed music. It's all what I call programmed sound as, as opposed to, to music, you know. So um, it's just, you know, I look back and, and I, I, I'm very, very lucky to, to go through the, the point in time in music that I did in the 70s and the 80s, and, and I, 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 I turn off at, at, at uh, when MTV came on because I think music then went from being audio to visual, and uh, you know that was a turning point as well. So uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's a little bit of uh, history, but uh, there's a there's a big gap there right now because there's there's got to be places for musicians to perform and enter, entertainers to perform and. When David Bowie came out here and, and hit the scene out here, I just put up some pictures in 1976 of David and I in recording studio together, um, you know, and, and Iggy Pop and guys like that, where they didn't have any money. They, they were just trying to trying to make ends meet. They're trying, you know, they had a name, but they were still trying to make uh, make that big name for themselves. And guys like uh, Leon Russell and, and Elton John and and Rod Stewart, and uh, you know, you can name hundreds of them that that were still trying to make their their name out here in in Hollywood, in California, in Los Angeles, and and on the club scene that was so prominent. And Led Zeppelin at, at the Whiskey. I mean, remember that seventy five, yeah. seventy six, seventy seven. You know, um, those were fantastic times and uh, days I'll always remember. Well, it, do you think that um, the internet has hurt music or oh, yeah. helped it 
No, it's it's hurt. It. It's hurt music because for 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 the simple reason that people don't have a value for music anymore. No. You used to have to go and buy a forty-five or an album or a, a set tape or in even later years uh, CDs. Um, now it's it's a foregone conclusion that music is free, and you download it and you send it around to all your friends and you share all this music for free. They don't understand there's a price tag that goes on that music. And, you know, there's, there's people that, that, that put out hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce and put together arrangements and, you know, put together a 10 or 12 uh, song CD and then put it out there and then it's it's just it goes on the internet and it's just downloaded for free you know or or you pay 99 cents and you share it with everybody you know um it, right. there's it's lost its credence whereas before you used to go to tower records and buy every album that you wanted and there was there was relevance to it you paid six seven dollars for a for a an album and it was also a way of charting because you could you, uh, uh, across the the counter, you could tell how many units were sold and how many units were were actually being uh, bought by by the consumer. Um, that's gone. You, you don't have any control over that anymore. And you know they're giving away gold and silver and platinum albums nowadays for was it ten, twenty, fifty thousand units. When I was in the business uh, at its peak, if you didn't do a million. You're probably not going to be signed to that record album. If you brought something out and it didn't clear a million, you're probably not going to be on that record uh, label for very long. Uh, right. You know, and you, you know, you've got guys like we were doing five and six and seven platinums, you know, uh, uh, times platinum. So, um, you know, you talk about, you know, the Eagles, which I grew up with, the guys like Glenn Fry and and, and those from um, from uh, Echo Park area when when they were first came through. Um, you know, they had the Eagles had albums on the Billboard charts for 20 years. You know, yeah. You know, and some court. of them are still on there, aren't they? They are. They are. And Carol King, who's a very good friend, and Carol, who I you know I adore because I I, I learned how to write music because of Carol King and, and Helen Reddy and people like that. Um, you know, they had uh, Carol had uh, Tapestry on, and I think it's still on the Billboard charts to this day. Um, Tapestry was definitely on there for 25 straight years. I mean, it's a classic album. I yeah, mean, Dark, Dark Side of the Moon was on for I think it was 15 years, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I, I did I did something on my radio show recently about Dark Side of the Moon, and it was when you add up all the time it was on the Billboard charts, it came out to be like 15 years. So I mean, there's the, that's good and bad. Um, it's good from the standpoint that the music is brilliant. It's bad from the standpoint that there's nothing knocking it off. You know, there's nothing coming along today that's knocking it off, right? That's true. That's yeah. true. Um, and, and I, I talk to kids that are 14, 15, 16 years old, and I ask them, what's your favorite band? And I'm amazed because a lot of them come back and say Led Zeppelin. Fantastic, because the song does remain the same. Right. Uh, no <laughs> but uh, the bad part is that the – the youth of today don't have a Led Zeppelin of their own. They don't have a Rod Stewart of their own. They don't have a Beatles of their own. They don't have an El Chicano of their own. They're, they're, they're still searching out for good music, and they have to go back in time to get that. Well, it, it's interesting. I guess the closest thing we have these days is Taylor Swift. Right, right, yeah. There's, and it, it was all the, the Internet that really got her going. Well, yeah, the, it... it, it the internet plays a role, a, an important role in music today, but it's a targeted role. Right. Like I said before, you don't have that competition. Whereas um, in the clubs and in the, on on the uh, the charts and putting out albums, you had a lot of competition. Nowadays, it seems like the the stars of today are targeted. They're they're right. chosen and and they're manipulated. And but that's the way. That's the way TV is. That's the way PR is. I mean, that's why I call it Kardashian factor, where you know, they, they make something out of nothing and stick with that. You know, and I'm not putting down Taylor Swift or anything like that. They are talented people, but they don't have the competition that that the, no. 70s, the 80s had, and and uh, that was a different era. It was a, it was a different way of doing things, and uh, you know, I mean, if, if I, I I say to a lot of people, tell, give me. 
the name of 20, name me 20 great bands of the last 10 years. And very few can come up with them. I challenge anybody. I can, I can name you a hundred bands of the, um, of, of the 1970s and 80s. I can, you know, tremendous bands, huge bands. But if you had to do it over the next last 10, 20 years, I'd go with you two and then I'd be mm-hmm. starting scratching my head, trying to figure out who's going to come along, you know, next. So, um, the problem with today's music is it's come and go. They come right. and they go real quick. Um, and will, will we be talking about the bands of the 2015, 2014, 2013 in 40 years, like we're doing in the seventies and, and I don't think so. Well, it's interesting because what pops to my mind when you were talking about the live music and stuff, you had the Grateful Dead with their dead heads. You don't right. have the fans willing to travel all over the place. The closest thing would be the Dave Matthews Band, who has a huge following that follows them around. Yep. But overall, you don't have that mystique of following a band. Yeah. I think the only the only one I see like that today, um, over and above, like you said, there is the Zach Brown Band. They have yes. been fallen, and uh, Zach Brown and uh, and uh, Daniel De Los Reyes, um, who is the percussionist, uh, was with El Chicano. He he, he played with El Chicano in, in Las Vegas, uh, and Daniel Daniel's brother, Walfredo Reyes Jr., was also the drummer for El Chicano for a while too. And, and Wally's now out with the Chicago, but um, the Zach Brown band has an amazing following, and and they they have they they remind me a lot of uh, the old Creedence or or you know that type of thing because they're a rock um, country rock type of influence, um, and uh, the Almond Brothers was another one that were back in those days. But uh, Zach Brown band is is a great band, uh, one of, one of the few bands around today that I would go see and spend money to to watch. Yeah, it, it's there are, and even the country music mm-hmm. is getting very much filtered in almost like there's communities or communes in on the internet that it's very fractural yeah. as it, it used to be. And there's nothing like a live show. No, no, and, and I, I, I still to this day, I still, I, I still produce to this day, and I still produce live. I let the music bounce off the wall. I have as many musicians in the room as I can. Uh, when I when I produce, I'm producing like a live show. So, you know, I don't layer and uh, I don't have a guitarist come in and lay down his piece and a bass come in and lay down his piece and a drum come in and lay down his piece. I do it live and um, to me that's the only way to do it because I'm looking for that magic moment that comes out of musicians playing off of each other and right. getting that extra boost when, uh, when somebody does something special and you get you know, that challenge to do, to compete and, you know, match what he just did. And that, that's, that to me is special. It's always going to be special. It's very interesting. I'm also thinking of how the jam sessions and you show some pictures on Facebook on W Rock Mm -hmm. group, the jam sessions, people just coming in all of a sudden you start recording it because it's a jam session and you never know what's going to happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, groups like War would not be around today if it weren't for jam sessions because what you had, what 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 War used to do with, um, you know, with their songs, um, Me and Baby Brother and mm-hmm. Rider and, uh, you know, All Day Music, those were 20-minute jams. And what they would do at the end of the 20-minute jam is they would they would uh, edit those down. They would they would mix those down to three and four minute songs, and you know and you know the guys from War would come in later and hear what 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 transpired out of a twenty minute jam, and that would become Me and Baby Brother. That would become uh, mm-hmm. that would become um, All Day Music, and and then all the, the you know you know Summer you know, is another favorite one Summer's of mine. Yeah, Fill the Line, another one. Yeah. Uh, you know, great, great hits, but those, those, those came out of jams. They would go in a room and just jam for 20 minutes, and that's what would come out of it. You know, and then it would be edited down to, you know, the best of um, the best three minutes of that that jam. But you, you'd get the synergy, you'd get the energy, you'd get that that special moment that made War famous and made made those songs memorable and still being performed today. 
uh, another great band of that era is Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, right. And what what made them so special? Maurice White, what Maurice White, without a doubt, Maurice White made Earth, Wind, and Fire special uh, because Maurice White, though he does not play with the band today, was the most influential person in that band and the arrangements he put together the uh, unbelievable i mean uh, maurice was an icon he, in my own eyes because he when he came out to california in the 70s he brought out a concept of 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 earth wind and fire that only he knew at that point and then it spread so wild that you know if you look at earth wind and fire it's the early word with wind and fire the 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 original Earth, Wind, and Fire. There's so much energy involved with that, and so much going on on stage, uh, across the stage, and it's all Maurice. Maurice was was 100% behind what is is now um, an iconic band. Uh, Verdeen White, his brother, is still out on the road. Bass player is still on the road with with Earth, Wind, and Fire, and he he carries a great load and and does a tremendous job. But um, there'll never be another Maurice and. Maurice to this day goes down in my mind as one of the greatest minds in, in music. But Earth, Wind, and Fire were trem tremendous band, fantastic band. Um, I, the Beatles will always be unique to me because they transform um, doo wop into rock and roll. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they they were that bridge that did it. Um, I, a lot of bands of the Birds um, were a great band of uh, you know transition band. They they did a lot. Um, uh, Total. Um, you know, my great friend David Page, uh, who lives right down the street from me, uh, David transformed music with Toto in Africa and all mm -hmm. his uh, 99 and, uh, um, you know, some great, great songs. Uh, um, there's so many great bands of, of, of that era. Um, you know, uh, you, can, you, can, you can, I can list them off. I, I don't want to give credence to one over the other, but there were so many fantastic bands. Uh, that that I would go out and watch, and uh, but then you you also look at the transition of the Beatles into you know like Paul McCartney and Paul Paul is, was my neighbor and a great friend, um, and Paul took wings and and developed a rock and roll pop band and really transitioned the uh, rock into different eras, you know, and uh, you you got uh, you know Band on the Run, the the, the uh, fantastic Band on the Run era of of wings and. Uh, and Linda McCartney, who gets maligned for being Paul's wife, but Linda was a great, great keyboardist, a great vocalist, and I love Linda. I mean, and I'll fight anybody that tells me that Linda should not have been part of Wings. He, she was an integral part of Wings and and a great person, and uh, I miss her. And you know, and uh, you know, Wings Band on the Run was a fantastic period of time. John Lennon and Imagine those eras when. when when he broke away from the Beatles, uh, George Harrison, and God love him. I mean, I love George. He was a, uh, you know, a fantastic friend. And Danny um, uh, Harrison today, uh, George's uh, son, mm -hmm. is fit an image. If you saw yes. that, he looks just like his father. And you know, I, I, I'm I'm looking forward to do some stuff with Danny because I've been talking to Danny over the last couple of years about getting together. He's living out here in Venice, California now. And um, uh, Danny's a spitting image of his father, but ha also has the talent of his father, and which, which is hard to, to put together. Um, you know, talent and offspring are, are two things that don't normally go together. Well, it's it's got to be a little bit of a pressure to be, number one, looking so much like his dad and with a legacy his dad has left. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. You, you see that again also with, with Julian and, and Sean. Yes. Uh, the Lennon boys um, and uh, John uh, uh, J James McCartney, uh, or, uh, uh, Paul's uh, son. They're tough, tough roles. They're tough roles to follow. But Danny's done done it well. Uh, yes. he, he sat in the background, did his thing. He was Danny Harrison. He wasn't George Harrison's son, right. and I respect that. And um, you know, he he did uh, a, an amazing job because when George died. Um, and that was a sad, sad time. There was yes. another time when, when you know, David just passed, uh, David Bowie just passed. And when George uh, passed, uh, part of me went, with, part of my music life went with him because I, uh, I love George. He was a great, great guy. 
And uh, he was working on, on an album at the time of his death. And Danny stepped in and finished it. And that was amazing to me because, first of all, big, big shoes to fill. Yeah. Uh, but to, to take on the courage to do that, but he did it with love and, and he wanted to finish his dad's legacy. And, and that was an amazing situation, uh, you know, at that time. And, uh, you know, again, it's amazing because George has been gone so, for so long now. It's, you know, time is flying by, but mm-hmm. you know, Danny has grown up and I, I love, I love it. And he's doing well and he's, he's, he's going to, he's going to make his own mark as Danny Harrison, not George's uh, son. And I, I'm so proud of that. I'm so happy for that. Is there anybody that you're seeing out there right now that has the same kind of energy as this era that could possibly bring the passion and the love and the fun of music back into? There's there's one guy out there that that I'm really happy that I I, I produced uh, on on the El Chicano album. Um, the young guy coming up is a fantastic keyboard player, and he too has a legacy that's hard to uphold, and that's that's uh, uh, Salvador Santana. Uh, oh yeah, Carlos Santana's son. Um, he's he's great, man. He's you know he was so humble. I had him in in studio, and I I wrote a believe it or not I wrote a rap song. Okay. And it's a it's a rap song tribute to El, El Chicano. It'll be coming out soon, and, and the whole world will hear it. But um, I was it was so so cool to have uh, Salvador involved because here was a new generation of music coming through, but had the history of of, of, of Carlos Santana. And here we have Carlos's son Salvador um, actually doing a uh, a tribute to El Chicano and. So it, it brought two forces together, the old and the new, but then the Santana and the El Chicano eras, because right. what, what, what was Santana of Northern California, El Chicano was the same down here in Southern California. And they're, they're almost like brothers in a way, don't you think? Oh, yeah. yeah, without a doubt. I mean, the guys from Santana used to come and sit in on and watch El Chicano and vice versa. And there was, you know, they were all so much alike, but so much so different, you know, they were or alike but different, and uh, and it was good to see guys like 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 um, Salvador coming through on his own. And what a keyboard player he is! He's a brilliant keyboard player. He played V three and piano on my my songs, um, and did a great great job of it. And was very very humble. He's a an amazing guy, and uh, you know uh, uh, I love him. And I love I love the fact that he was able to come out and share his talent and. Uh, and do it well, yeah, and uh, yeah, he did a great job. So yeah, Salvador Santana's coming through, he's a great guy, you know, uh, Danny is coming through. Uh, there, there's a lot of guys out there um, that that uh, that are that are talented individuals that, that just need a break. They need they need to they need to be able to go out and record or or, or perform. And uh, Salvador just did a tour with his father. Um, he was he was uh, playing with his father out there on on tour with him. So. Um, Good luck to him. I, I think it's it's great. And of course, I know I know uh, his mother Deborah. I've known her for many many years. And uh, Deborah just got married. Congratulations, Deborah. She got married again. Uh, Carlos and Deborah divorced a few years ago, but uh, you know his mother uh, just got married. And uh, Deborah Santana. Kudos to you. That uh, congratulations to her. That's awesome. With the music today, and do you see more of? It's like yesterday, looking through all the people making comments about David Bowie, it was striking that there were a few people like Madonna who really did. You could obviously see the influence David Bowie has had on her. Do you feel that that influence is going to carry on with the next generation or do you see it slowly fading away? I'd like to hope that it continues on. Uh, Victoria was just asking me the, uh, yesterday at the same time, well, you know, where did Boy George come into all this? You know, uh, yeah. Boy George before David or was David before Boy George? Well, Boy George got a lot of influence off of David Bowie. I mean, there's no Definitely. And I, I, I just hope the chain keep continues. Uh, you know, people were influenced from boy george and 
and moved on from that. And yeah, I, I, you know, I hope that the music continues on and there's influence being being generated throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the generations. Uh, it's it's hard to say what will happen because there's uh, a lot less influence now than there was before. Mm -hmm. uh, we were we were influenced by so much. I mean, fusion be, be, became fusion because you were incorporating so many influences of music in your life into uh, your own blend of music, which became, you know, like El Chicano. I mean, you take El Chicano or Santana or, you know, that ilk, and you'll see that there's there's jazz involved there, there's funk involved there, there's there's rock and roll involved there, there's, there's fusion, there's R&B, and there's soul. Um, and there was blending of music together, and that was taking influence from a lot of sources. Um, and again, that's that's not so much done today where it's all programmed. I mean, a lot of it's programmed today. You don't, you're not allowed to go out there and, and extend yourself as, as music in the seventies and early eighties were able to do. And, um, you know, and I, 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 another guy that, that that's gone now that was a huge influence on my life and um, on others was Freddie Mercury. Um, and we we're just talking about Freddie yesterday too, because, yeah. Um, David and Freddie were, uh, Victoria played a, a thing, uh, sent me over a, a thing on my email on the Freddie uh, and David uh, doing a uh, acapella, you know, just singing together, uh, which again is amazing. You know, it's amazing if you, it's on Google, I think, or YouTube or somewhere, right. where you can find it on there. But um, the, the influence there again is, you know, I, 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 I Freddie's gone now many, many years and, I uh, I met with Freddie probably about four or five months before he he passed away, and I'll 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 share the story with you because it's it's a story I want to share with as many people as I can because when you meet with a guy like Freddie Mercury who was an icon you know and one of the best stage performers that ever lived, mm -hmm. and I had the pleasure of, of of working with two of the best stage performers I've ever seen in my life. One was Freddie Mercury, and the other was Frank Sinatra. And in Freddie Mercury's case, I, I asked Freddie, Freddie, how do you write songs? I mean, I'm a songwriter myself, so I'm trying to get influence from him. I said, he said, hold on, Jerry, I, you got to understand, I don't write songs. I said, okay, um, tell me more. You know, where, where is this going? He says, I write, I write ballads, I write, write anthems, I write, I write songs that that my audience will sing back to me. That's what I want out of my songs. I want to go on stage and hear this, the audience sing back to me. And this brought back so many memories because if you go back to, I think it was 1976, 77, 78, somewhere in that range, where uh, Queen is, is playing uh, Live Aid at, at uh, Wembley Stadium. And if you go and look that up on YouTube and you look up Radio Gaga and watch how he, how Freddie, has the entire audience of over a hundred thousand people singing Radio Gaga back to him. That hit home to me because then I realized I understand what you're talking about now because I experienced that. I'm on stage on that. If you look on there, I'm I'm leaning up against one of the speakers, amazed, looking out at that crowd, and Freddie's within ten feet of me, twenty feet of me, in total control of a hundred thousand people with one little microphone, and the rest of the band is playing along. But go on there. If you don't do anything else today or the rest of the week or the rest of the month and you want to experience a music extravaganza, go on there, Radio Gaga, Live Aids, Wembley Stadium. Just put in Radio Gaga, um, Wembley, uh, or Freddie Mercury, Wembley, uh, Radio Gaga, and it'll blow your mind. Because not only does he have them singing, he has them clapping in unison, and it looks like a wave that's going throughout the entire stadium. And this is Freddie Mercury at his best. And again, you're, you're talking about influences. These are the influences that, that don't exist today. These guys don't, they're, they're gone. They're, they're taking that away from music because they're taking music away from the general public. It, it's, it, Freddie was a, a, a showman because he was allowed to go on stage and do his thing. It wasn't all prearranged. It wasn't right. all pre preset. Um, he was, you couldn't tell Freddie what to do. Freddie went out there and just lived it. He lived Th that that two hours on stage, you, nobody knew what Freddie was going to do, but it was going to be great. It was going to come out fantastic. It was going to come out memorable. They were going to use it on YouTube for 40 years, and 
like I was saying today, if you go back and look on up on YouTube, look on Radio Gaga, look on Wembley Stadium, and you know you'll see me amazed on stage as well. <laughs> it's I mean there are so many musicians and groups that they tell stories. They invite you into their world during that era, um, and it's just a totally different sound. And I hope that more influential people take their magic and bring it own it and make it their own because the originality is what's really missing these days in music to me uh, without a doubt and I, th I think one of the biggest flaws in music today is the general a atmosphere of entertainment and the the way the world is today is that everybody wants to go from nothing to to the penthouse in one full swoop they don't want to pay the price and, and Music in the past was always working from one club to the next club, moving your way up the ranks, learning your way up the ranks, and competing your way up the ranks. Now everybody wants to go from a concept to the number one show on television or the number one band in the country because of a concept rather than hard work. And right. what lacks today, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is that very few bands and very few entertainers today are learning their trade. And, you know, and I say that from the standpoint, if you do get it to the top and you start to fall, fall down, um, that's what happens with the X factor. You go, you go from nothing to the, to the, the icon uh, of the week. Uh, and then nobody hears from you much anymore and you're gone. Um, you know, they don't know what to do after they reach that, that pinnacle because they've been brought there by something or someone else. Uh, whereas before in the seventies and early eighties and, when I came through this, there was a lot of uh, a lot of clubs you could play. There was there was you know you you moved from one club to another and moved on and and you, you established yourself as uh, as an uh, an entertainer or a a uh, you know iconic band because of hard 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 work. And and that is something that is really missing these days. Is almost like the entitlement. Okay, I have this idea, so it needs to be brilliant now. Right. You have to embrace it and give me millions and millions of dollars so in a way they can disappear. Um, like I said, the passion is not quite the same. There are a few people that I think that are coming up um, more so in the 90s. Um, the guitar playing of John Mayer is amazing yeah. um, to me. So there is a lot of things. The other thing, do you think it would be possible to bring back the venue system these days? Um, it's getting harder and harder because the general public gets so much brought into their house now that it's very hard for small clubs to exist anymore. And they've become real estate more than anything else. And you got the Whiskey A Go Go in, in Hollywood, which is an iconic club that will soon close down because it's going to be sold. You had oh, wow. uh, blues that was sold in, in Hollywood that was, you know, an iconic place for many, many years and, and hundreds of bands came through. Um, you've got a lot of stuff now that, I mean, I, I, I remember driving up, you know, into Hollywood in the seventies and you'd have five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 clubs that were all, you know, standing room only. You couldn't get into them. Um, because so much is brought into the house now, um, by so many means, internet, TV, YouTube, whatever. Um, you've got a lazy society now that doesn't want to go out and do their thing. Yeah. Whereas, whereas before, that was foregone conclusion. On Friday nights, you were going to be somewhere. Uh, right. Whether it's Filthy McNasty's or, or Whiskey or The Roxy or one of the hundred clubs in Southern California you could go to. Um, those are few and far between now, and it's very hard for uh, – for the clubs to, to exist because the general concept of music has changed. And like I said before, it's, it's, it's got less value now because it's just considered free. And again, it's easy to get music. It's, it's available to you. Um, it's downloaded to you. It's brought into your home. You know, you, you know, it, it's sad. It, the, uh, but it's, it's, it's a sign of the times you have to live with it. So you have to move on and figure out uh, how to work with it. Yeah. Definitely. So if there is one song that was your favorite song, what would it be? I got to go back to, I mean, I, it, being from El Chicano, I, I, I love all the El Chicano stuff. Being a 
a person of the 60s and 70s. I love all the Beatles. I love Zeppelin. I, lo I traveled with Zeppelin for four years. I traveled with ACDC for, for two years. Um, I love all their music, but I got to go back to uh, Jefferson Starship. And it was written as Jefferson Airplane, but my, my, one of my favorite songs of all time because it, of the arrangement. I just caught on the arrangement of this back in the day in Grace Slick. And uh, I know Grace, she, she's a great lady, and I love her dearly. And it goes back to the Jefferson Starship, and, and it's called Miracles. And that, that, to me, sums up my life. It's all been a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> I look back and I say, you know, I never planned this. I never expected this. I, You know, when I tell people about what I do for a living, they all, their jaw drops and mine drops with them because, you know, I, I never expected to be who I am and what I am and have the friends I have. Uh, they were guys I grew up with, man. but Miracles is would be my uh, my song for, for a lot of reasons. And uh, arrangement, the production of it, fantastic. The vocals on it are amazing. The music on it is amazing. Uh, Jefferson Starship Miracles would be the song that, it, you know, if I had to choose one song, as you've asked me to do, that's it. Awesome. So Gary Gallagher, I thank you so much for spending time with us on Abstract Illusions and open your storybook and the miracle <laughs> of your life. Um, I thank you truly. And I wish you all the best with El Chicano. Rock on. Um, so I thank you very much for being on the show today. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, thank you for, for sharing this hour with me, and I appreciate it. I love your show, and uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm humbled that you even asked me on here. So thank you so much, and uh, to all you listening in, rock on with Jennifer. Thank you, Gary, and thank you for listening to Abstract Illusions. This is Jennifer Hellman wishing with each breath of air you gain new insights, imagination, and enjoy the magic. Have a good week.